So in my opinion, printing is an incredibly important part of the image making process. And that's why today in this video, we are going to make a print together. Except we're not really gonna make a print because I just made this one for this video. So I'm gonna show you how to make a print. Stick around. So if you're new to the world of printing or you've never done too much image prep before, today I'm gonna to walk you through my process of how I prepare my film scans for printing. And this applies if you're printing at home or also if you're, say, sending off to a lab or something. And maybe in the past, if you don't have much experience printing, uh, you've just sent them uh, one of your exported images or if you're printing at home, you just click print. But it's definitely really important to prepare your images, uh, sizing, sharpening, stuff like that, just to really get the most out of them when they're printed on paper. Okay, so the first place we're gonna start today is talking about monitor calibration. And we're just gonna touch really, really briefly on this. Uh, if you have never calibrated your monitor or you don't know much about it, definitely look into it, read up, uh, and learn a little bit more about it. And then you should definitely pick up a, a calibration device and uh, run it on your monitor. And basically what's happening uh, when you're calibrating your monitor is you're using this device to take a bunch of readings. It basically just hangs over your screen like this. And it reads a bunch of targets and patches, um, which are, are colors and tones, and it compares those against a set standard. So for example, let's say it's reading a red patch. It's going to compare how your monitor's currently displaying that red versus uh, the set standard of how red should look. And it's gonna do this uh, across all of these different targets. And then the software is going to generate what's called an ICC profile, which your computer will load up and it'll use that to display uh, the colors accurately on your screen. And obviously it depends on how uh, high quality of a screen you have um, in terms of how close the calibration software can get those colors and tones versus how they should look. So the, the higher quality monitor, the better it's gonna be able to do that. But regardless, it's still a really important step. And then the other thing it's gonna to do too is it's gonna read the brightness levels of your monitor. And brightness is really important because most monitors uh, from the factory are set way too high. So for example, my monitor is calibrated to 120 uh, in terms of luminance. And to get there, I had to drop my brightness all the way down to 20 from 100. Um, and 100 to 120 uh, for a luminance reading is uh, kind of what's recommended for printing, uh, just to be able to judge what's on your screen, the tones and all that, and have them come across uh, looking correct when printed on paper. So if you've never done that before, chances are your monitor brightness is set way too high and that's really gonna affect how your image looks when it's printed on paper. So really, really important. Uh, if you haven't calibrated your monitor, read up on it a little more, uh, buy a calibration device. Uh, it's really a must for a, a color calibrated workflow as a photographer. So you should definitely do that. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna look at two images. And the one uh, is the one that I've printed, but before that, we're gonna look uh, at an initial image uh, just to start here because it's a good spot. Uh, and the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, sizing an image, and that's really where you're gonna start. And that is really determined by uh, the size of the file that you have to begin with. So uh, if it's a film scan, or if it's from a digital camera, uh, you're going to have a certain resolution. Obviously with a digital camera, it's gonna depend on the megapixels. Um, with a film scan, it's gonna depend on how large you got the, the, uh, the negative scanned at. Uh, and what the resolution is. So for example, this image right here was shot on a Fuji GA645 and it is showing a dimensions of basically 3000 pixels wide by 2200 tall. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open this up in Photoshop. So Photoshop is where I do my printing from. I edit in Lightroom, print from Photoshop. It's just the, the way that works for me and I'm really happy with it. So we'll wait for that to load. Okay, so the original file size that you have is gonna determine how big you can print this and still have it 
uh, looking nice and sharp and detailed. I mean, obviously you could print this at whatever size you want, but uh, if you go too big um, and the file's not big enough, the image, it's not gonna print well, it's gonna look soft, it's not gonna be sharp. Uh, so if we go up here to image, image size, and we're gonna just zoom this out. And we have a bunch of um, numbers up here and we're gonna go through them. A really important one is this image size. So the total size of this image uh, at the resolution it was scanned at is 40 megabytes. And this is a relatively small scan for medium format film. This probably would have been a lab scan at their lowest resolution. And what this image size is made up of uh, currently is the physical dimensions, uh, which this is set to around 12 by nine inches, uh, and then the resolution, which is pixels per inch. Um, it's set to 240, that's just a default. It really doesn't matter what this is at. Basically, if you change any of these, you have to change this. If you change this, you have to change these because you're, this is what the image is made up of, these numbers here, and it's kind of a balancing act if you don't want uh, Photoshop to basically create any information that didn't exist. Hopefully this makes a little more sense as we dive into this. But basically, let's say I wanted to print this image at, uh, let's say I, I wanted to go up to 15 inches wide. So we're gonna hit 15. Uh, and you can see now up here, the image size has jumped from 55 megabytes uh, from 39. So anytime we're, we're getting an increase uh, in size up here from the original number, that means that Photoshop is creating information that didn't exist because to go larger uh, from a physical standpoint and stay at the same resolution, Photoshop has to create information because it doesn't have any more than what we started with. So since we're going bigger, it's creating information. So a way to get this number back down or closer to where we started is to start dropping the resolution, the pixels per inch. So let's say we go to 200. So now we're just underneath this original number of 39.5. So that means that we've increased the physical dimensions uh, of this print, uh, and we've done so in a way where Photoshop hasn't created any new information. So that's kind of step one and pretty important to understand. So my rule of thumb is I never want to go above the original uh, image size number because I don't want Photoshop to create any information uh, that didn't uh, exist already. But there are limits to it. So the resolution is important, pixels per inch. And for me, uh, my rule of thumb really is uh, for larger prints, let's say uh, like maybe 13 by 19 and larger, uh, I don't really wanna be anywhere below say 220, uh, but probably closer to 240 pixels per inch. Um, and for smaller prints, obviously you could go as high as you can with staying within these bounds, but really, uh, around 360, uh, I don't typically go any larger than that because I don't, uh, I've never noticed a difference going any higher than that for pixels per inch. So going back to our original numbers, if I wanted to print at this 15 inches wide and I had to keep, uh, I had to adjust my resolution to keep my image size within bounds, we were down around 200. Uh, so for me, I wouldn't print at 200 pixels per inch. Uh, it's too low and I wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be happy with the quality. Um, so I just wouldn't print this uh, specific image at 15 inches wide. So if we go back to the original width, I think we were at 12 uh, and then we could go, let's see, maybe we can get this up to 240. So somewhere around 240 pixels per inch, I could print 12 inches wide. And that's still for me a little bit low. Um, so really what happens in a scenario like this is I would just have to go and I would have to get the uh, negative rescanned at a higher resolution um, because I would rather do that and have a larger scan uh, instead of get Photoshop to basically enlarge this and create information that didn't exist. So I hope that makes sense. We're gonna look at a, another image uh, just to kind of get that point across a little more. So this 
Next image, this is from a Pentax 672, and you can see that this image was scanned quite a bit larger. This is around 5,600 pixels wide uh, by 4,500 pixels tall. So this probably would have been uh, one of the largest scans that I could have got done uh, at the lab that I use. So let's open this one up in Photoshop. Okay, so we'll go up to image, image size. Again, it's gonna show us our default resolution of 240. Uh, so right now, uh, our image size is 146 megabytes. And at this scan size at 240 pixels per inch, uh, it's showing that we could basically print almost 24 inches wide. And for that large of a print, I would be totally okay printing at 240 pixels per inch uh, because I know just from experience and from tests that uh, that would produce results that I'm happy with. And as you gotta keep in mind, as you start printing larger, people are also going to be looking at your work from further away, unless they're a photographer. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. And that's why you can get away with uh, a little bit lower of a resolution if you're printing larger. But let's say we wanted to uh, print this one at 15 inches wide, which is uh, what we're gonna do for this demonstration. So I'm gonna change my physical dimensions to 15 inches wide, so right around 12 by 15. Now you can see our image size is dropped down to about 60 megabytes from 146. So we, we can now know we can bump this resolution number up. We might as well. And like I said, for me, 360, I usually don't go higher than that because I know from experience that uh, I can't really notice any difference from 360 or above. So I'm gonna leave it at 360. And you can see now our total image size is up to 133. So we're still under this original image size. Um, so everything is really good. We've resized this. Uh, we've dropped down the physical dimensions to 12 by 15, up the resolution because we had information left. Uh, and it, we know that Photoshop hasn't created anything that didn't exist. So we're gonna be good to go. So we're gonna click okay. And uh, just one quick note for resample, I always just leave it set to bicubic. I don't want uh, bicubic sharper for reduction. I don't want Photoshop doing any sharp, like automatic sharpening or anything like that. Uh, I wanna be able to take care of that myself, so. Okay, so we have our 15 inch wide image here. Uh, and the next step that we're gonna do is we're going to sharpen our image. Uh, really, really important when it comes to print sharpening. And the one note that I, I do wanna uh, touch on is that when it comes to sharpening, you wanna make sure that the original file you're working with uh, is already nice and detailed. So you don't wanna start with a soft image. You wanna make sure that uh, you've sharpened your image uh, in your editing software so that it looks good to eye, what you would use for web, stuff like that. Uh, you definitely don't wanna start with a soft uh, image because when it comes to sharpening for print, uh, you're kind of taking things a little further than you normally would for web. You're gonna sharpen it just a, a little chunkier or crispier than you would for web. Uh, so it's important to start with a really uh, nice image. So if we go into 100% here, and this is the area we're gonna focus on, uh, these blinds here. And nine times out of 10, the sharpening method that I use for printing is really straightforward. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate our background layer, and we're gonna apply a filter to it. But what we're gonna do first is we're gonna convert for smart filters. And what that does, once it loads up, if you don't convert your layer for smart filters, when you uh, apply a filter to it and choose the setting of that filter, you can't go back in and change that setting if you aren't happy with it. So since we're sharpening, uh, if you convert for smart filters, you can open that filter back up and readjust, uh, which is handy if you're sharpening and you need to kind of play around with how things look. So we're gonna go filter, other, and go to high pass. And you'll see the whole image uh, goes gray, uh, but what's happening here is you can see any high contrast edges, um, there's kind of this radius glow. And obviously the higher we jack up the radius setting, the bigger that gets. But for me, I almost always land on uh, two or three pixels. So we're gonna start at two, we're gonna click okay. And then we're gonna change the blend mode of our layer to overlay. And now things are gonna look normal again. So if you look in the blinds, that's on. That's off, on, off. 
and back on again. So this is a really nice way to sharpen because what it's doing is it's only targeting high contrast edges. So it's not like say an unsharp mask where you're applying this sharpening effect to the entire image. And as a result, uh, areas that don't have any detail are getting a bunch of uh, essentially noise added to them. So if we zoom in, we're at like 300% and we look at the sky, that's with our layer on and that's with, and that's with it off, on, off. So almost nothing is happening in the sky at all because there's no high contrast edges. There's no detail in the sky. There shouldn't be detail in the sky. So this is a really, really nice way to um, just increase uh, the sharpening in your image, but only apply it to areas that actually have detail. And let's just go back in. And I'm, I know that I'm happy at two here, but again, with the smart filters, we can double click on high pass. Now this comes up uh, and now we can adjust and we can see what it looks like real time. So obviously we'll go back to two and that's at three, but uh, to me, that's too much. I'm gonna stay at two. And like I said before, when it comes to sharpening, you basically wanna take things just a little bit further than you normally would when you're sharpening for screen. So for me right now, looking at this image, uh, it looks a little bit over sharpened, not too much, but I, I wouldn't go this far if I was just sharpening uh, for web. But I know uh, from tests and from practice, when I'm sharpening for print, uh, for what I see to translate to, to the paper, it has to be a little bit further than it normally would uh, if this were just for screen. So I'm gonna leave this as is. That's pretty simple. Sometimes I will add, um, like a smart sharpen layer after this with the radius set really, really, really low uh, just for uh, fine detail. But uh, this image is definitely sharp enough. So we're gonna roll with this. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, worry about paper size. So we set our image size to 15 inches wide. We're working with a 12 by 15. And I'm gonna print this on 13 by 19 paper because I wanna have a white border on it, which is what I do for all of my prints. So uh, instead of just saving this file and sending it to a lab and saying you want to print it on 13 by 19 paper um, or trying to do it yourself to the print uh, setup box, uh, there's a good way to avoid any issues that might come up with your image getting resized. And that is just going back up to image, going to canvas size uh, and setting, in this case, our canvas size to 19 inches wide by 13 inches tall. We want our canvas extension color set to white Click OK, and there we go. So now we, we're basically set up our paper. So that means that our whole, uh, technically our whole image now is 13 by 19 wide, but the actual um, photograph is still at 12 by 15. So if we now sent this to a lab and printed it on 13 by 19 paper, we know that uh, nothing is gonna get resized or squeezed or anything like that because the file we're sending is the exact dimensions of the paper that it's gonna get printed on. And the same with printing at home. Uh, we know that now when we open the print dialog box, our whole entire image here is set to the paper that we're gonna print on. So just a nice way to kind of avoid any issues that could pop up uh, in the future. Okay, last thing we're gonna, gonna do here is we're gonna go back and talk about color again. And this is really the last step of the printing uh, process here. And what we want to do is we wanna go up to uh, proof setup because we're gonna proof our print now and click custom. And this is already on for me. So if you're printing at a lab or if you're printing at home, you wanna get your hands on uh, an ICC profile for the paper you're using and the printer you're using. So if you're printing with a lab, uh, nine times out of, out of 10, if it's a pro lab, they're gonna have uh, ICC profiles available for download on their website, depending on say, if you wanna print on Lester paper or matte paper, or whatever you choose. Uh, if you're printing at home, uh, the paper manufacturer you're using uh, will also have ICC profiles on their website for the paper you're using and the printer that you're using. So in this case, I am using uh, let's see here, Red River Palo Duro Soft Gloss Rag, and it's for a Canon Pro 10. So I downloaded the profile and now I can load it up here. Uh, and I have simulate paper color checked. So this is already on. So we're gonna hit Command Y to turn it off. And this will be incredibly hard to see because the simulate paper color, there's just such a minor difference. So on, off, on, 
And what this is doing is it's trying to just give you a representation of how this, how your image is gonna look when it's printed on a specific paper. Uh, so I'm gonna turn that off. That's not really why I use um, this proofing. Uh, mainly because the paper I use, uh, there isn't much of a shift. If you use some fine art papers and matte papers, it will show you quite a difference and then you can tweak a little bit if you want. But again, just all comes down to practice. But one of the main reasons I use this is for this gamut warning. So basically, depending on the ink you're using, which comes with your printer, and then depending on the paper you're using, uh, that specific combination is going to be able to produce a certain amount of colors and a certain amount of saturation. And anything that falls outside of that realm, uh, Photoshop is going to have to push back in, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, and different papers are gonna be better at handling colors and saturation than others. Uh, like glossy paper is gonna be better than say fine art paper and stuff like that. But what happens is if you click gamut warning, so nothing happened here because this is a fairly uh, low saturated image, but if we drop on a hue and saturation layer here, and let's say we just jack up the saturation. So you'll see as we start jacking up the saturation, we're getting uh, this kind of, these gray blobs everywhere. And anything that's turning gray is essentially Photoshop telling us that these specific colors are falling outside of the range of the uh, paper and ink combinations ability to uh, re reproduce. So reproduce these colors. So uh, we'll go back to zero. So right now, without this hue and saturation layer, uh, I'm not seeing any gray. So basically uh, I know that anything I see in this image uh, is going to be able to be reproduced by the printer and the paper and Photoshop isn't gonna have to do any tweaking. Uh, if I did have some kind of crazy saturation like this, I knew that anything in these ranges, mainly the, the reds it's looking like, those are gonna fall outside of the paper's uh, kind of gamut and Photoshop's gonna have to uh, tweak those to fit them inside of it. And Photoshop is pretty good uh, at doing this. Uh, it's all gonna depend on the rendering intent that you're using. So relative, colometric, and perceptual are, are kind of the two common ones. And those are just basically, uh, those decide the way that Photoshop uh, fits those out colors back into the gamut. Okay, so we proofed our image. We know that everything's good and that everything is falling inside of our paper's uh, gamut. I'm gonna go through this really quickly for anyone who do, does wanna print in Photoshop. At, at this point, if you're sending to a lab, you could just save your image as a TIFF and send it off, you'd be good to go. But uh, in this print dialog box, the first thing you wanna do, uh, usually this color handling is gonna be set to printer manages colors. So you wanna change it to Photoshop manages colors, really important, because then you can load up your printer profile. Uh, we're gonna go down, we're gonna pick ours, Red River Palo Duro Soft Gloss Reg. And then uh, our rendering intent is set to relative color metric. And if you hover over these, you'll notice that uh, Photoshop gives you a description of what each one does and how um, Photoshop fixes out of gamut colors. I almost always leave mine set to this relative color metric. And anytime that I have had uh, colors that have fallen outside of the, uh, the gamut range, I've always been totally happy with uh, whatever Photoshop's done because they've always looked how they should. So I just leave that. We'll go up to print settings really quickly. Uh, I already have mine set to 13 by 19 borderless. Um, and then we wanna go to quality and media. And for me, I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna pick uh, Pro Luster, which is the correct one for the paper that I use. Save it. And then I can go and click print. And it really is as simple as that once you've set up your image. Basically, you come into this print dialog box and the most important part is just setting up this color handling and loading up your profile. So you know that uh, Photoshop's going to uh, use the right profile for the paper and the ink that you're using. So overall, this is a pretty straightforward process. I try to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, it just all comes down to having a color managed workflow, uh, working within the limits of your original file, and then just sizing and sharpening your image properly. And I wanna mention as well that this is just the way that I work. Uh, it's a process that I learned years ago that's always produced results that look good to my eyes. It's definitely not the only way to work. Uh, I'm sure there's a hundred other ways you could do this and there's probably better ways you could do this, but this is what works for me. And I just wanted to share this for anyone who's looking to learn a little bit more about the printing process or maybe 
who's looking to try and get better results than they've gotten in the past. So I hope this helps. Uh, if you aren't following me on Instagram, my link is in the description below. Check it out. That's where I post all my current work. And as always, thank you guys. We'll see you soon. Thank you.